Hey everybody, it's Brad's friend Dave, the second best looking host of Comic Lab Podcast with a quick show note for this week's episode. So we had a reader that specifically asked us in their question to not mention their name. And being the true worldwide geniuses that we are, we then completely forgot about that and (laughs) went on to say their name six times in answering their question. So here's what we've done. Using the magic of modern editing, we have seamlessly inserted the name Ronaldo in any time that we've said their name out loud in the podcast. So you will not even notice. We have done it absolutely seamlessly. And with that, enjoy this week's show. So, Brad, I met my wife, Gloria, in high school. We started dating uh, the summer uh, just after I graduated high school. And it was a summer of wonderful, I told you before, long dates, like 12 hour, 14 hour dates where we just laugh and talk. And we would always end up on these dates at a restaurant that was affordable if you're 18, 19 years old. Um, yeah. uh, called Mandarin House. It was a really amazing Chinese restaurant. They had mm-hmm. great cashew chicken. They had really good uh, gold corn soup. Anyway, more more detail than you needed to know. Anyway, we love this restaurant. The whole <laughs> did, summer. Did they have appetizers, Dave? Did they have appetizers? <laughs> Brad, when you asked for water, you got water. It was amazing. The restaurant oh, was fantastic. Yes. No, anyway. So uh, this was, I don't know what, 27 years ago, uh, 28 years ago. Uh, we're falling in love at this restaurant, Brad. It has an amazing like mood for us. It has an yeah. amazing resonance in our relationship. Anyway, we happen to be back down in San Diego this weekend. Yeah. Uh, and we drive by it and we're like, let's get this for the kids. They'll see what we found, the restaurant we fell in love with, right? Yeah. So we call in the, we co- unfortunately couldn't go in, but we called in the, the order, we yeah. pick it up. I go in and I, I'm, I'm grabbing the two bags and I, the owner is there and uh-huh. he's old now, he's, he's an older guy. But I go, sir, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted you to know that 28 years ago, my wife and I fell in love in your restaurant. Over a series of dates, your restaurant was so meaningful to us. It brought us together. It has incredible resonance in our life. We thought we would bring our children back to show them the food that we fell in love with, which was oh. your restaurant. You were responsible in part for our burgeoning love. And he yeah. goes, huh? Oh. <laughs> That's all he said. <laughs> He just goes, huh, huh. That's and then it. he goes, just... and then he looks down the bill. And he goes, that'll be sixty-five ninety-two. <laughs> oh my god! He could not have cared less. <laughs> he could, <laughs> sir. Your restaurant brought us together. Whoa. It was the, it was the burgeoning moment of our relationship. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I guess people fall in love, don't they? Huh? Holy All right, well, sixty-five cats. ninety-two. He, I mean, just there's not a sentimental bone in this person's body. He's yeah, just he like, had nothing. Great. He just and I was and so me, who am kind of introverted and, and but I was like putting myself out there. I was like, yeah. sir, you're right, because I wanted a human moment of like letting this guy know yeah. that his restaurant had been, you know, instrumental in Gloria and my relationship, <laughs> and he didn't give a <laughs> shit. He could not have cared less. Huh. All right. Well, 65.92. Oh, my God. Did, did you tell him about the corn, the golden corn soup? I, I did, and he didn't care. He didn't <laughs> care. He's like, do you guys want utensils? And that was it. That was the... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, moly, on that note terrible. of emotional resonance, I'm going to say hello, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. And huh, I guess I'm his friend, Dave <laughs> Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of Stripped. And this week's Hour of Comics advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave... Dave, let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. And just a reminder that this show is going out live to our live gab friends and pals, the VIP members over at Comic Lab, patreon.com slash comic lab live gab level. You can watch the show recorded live every week, streamed live every week. Watch Brad and I record the podcast. And then, of course, check out the show in the archives. Absolutely. And the show is also being brought to you by Wacom over at W-A-C-O-M dot com. They're the makers of the portable, professional, powerful Wacom One. And the Wacom One being used in both Brad and my studio with great affection. And I, I noticed, by the way, this week on the Discord, two separate people said they picked up yes. the Wacom One, which is awesome. That's so that's right. really fun to see. All right, Brad, well, our first question over at patreon.com slash comic lab comes in from Dave Lerner. And Dave writes in, in a recent podcast, you said that a story starts with a character who wants or needs something. 
but you said there's a difference between a character wanting something and needing something. What's the difference as far as story goes? Isn't a need just a very strong want? Does it matter if Gramp wants or needs that coffee, except for strength of desire? In story terms, what's the difference? I both want and need your weekly Comic Lab <laughs> podcast and Pro Tips <laughs> podcast. Thank you so much, Dave Lerner. Dave, thank you. Glad to hear that you want and need a little Brad Geiger in your life. Don't that, we um, all? Don't we all? Yes. Uh, well, this is a great question. It comes down to a couple of storytelling terms that uh, tend to get uh, glossed over an awful lot. And, it, and it's worth our time uh, to go back into it and uh, uh, go even deeper on this subject. And really, to a certain extent, a lot of what you need to know about this topic comes from that great philosopher, Mick Jagger, who says that you don't always get what you want, but sometimes you get what you need. And... <laughs> That's, that's actually I love I love that you're quoting Mick Jagger as yeah. though uh, Mick Jagger, who who also would let you know to wear pants that are four <laughs> times too small for you. So yes. everyone can see if you dress to the left or the right. That's Mick Jagger's <laughs> philosophy for the week. That's uh, that's that's advice from Mick Jagger and every 40 plus man who just hasn't bought new pants lately. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> although we do them for different reasons. Uh, but it, it, there is a difference between want and need and the way I tend to to explain it uh, to people is that a want is something that the character actually wants. This character mm -hmm. wants this thing. They want to achieve something. They want to gain something. They want to do something. Uh, a need is seldom something that a character actually realizes. Uh, it's something that the universe uh, has decided that needs to happen for this character. Uh, right. The way I've I, 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 there's a lot of ways that we can talk about this. One of them is uh, Michael Scott from The Office is a great character because what he wants at the end of the day is a family. All right. What yeah. he needs is people skills. <laughs> you know, he needs he needs. I've heard <laughs> right. it phrased. Right. I've heard it phrased. He wants a family. He needs to calm down about it. <laughs> right. Uh, he needs to learn people skills. Uh, right. A want is something that the character can point out. A need is something that the universe points out. And, and sometimes, uh, 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 sometimes a character's need is not what they want. Right. It's not right. even on their radar, or maybe they actively don't want it, but it's what they need. Well, let's grab another well-known character, yeah. uh, Tony Stark from the, the new up-and-coming title of Marvel called <laughs> Iron Man. <laughs> yes. All right. So... Tony needs to keep those metal chunks away from his heart. He needs right. that or else he will die. He needs that. He wants it to be gone completely. He wants to not have to deal with any of that bullshit, right? Right. Or uh, the flip side with his alcoholism, he wants a drink. He needs to get into Alcoholic Anonymous, right? That's yeah. the, that's very different in terms of, and you can see the idea that the universe is conspiring, like Brad said, against you with your needs, but your wants are very often uh, uh, very different in terms of being personal, being uh uh, preferential, that kind of thing. And so yeah. you can actually write very interesting and complicated uh, conflicts between wants and needs that makes, uh, you know, Charlie Brown kicking the football so much more interesting and variated than you than just being like uh, Charlie Brown's an idiot. You know, uh, his wants and needs are basically fighting against each other. Right. Uh, and take uh, here's another example uh, that I used actually just yesterday uh, in my class to prove a different point. But it, it, it comes to this as well. Uh, when you write a story about a character that doesn't get what they want, but they get what they need, it's actually a, 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 can be some very compelling storytelling because we're, we're thanks to Hollywood and Burbank, we're expected to see a character get what they want. The character goes forth and tries to get what they want. And because Hollywood is kind of uh, positioned us to expect that Hollywood happy ending, a lot of times we we kind of guess the ending, right? right. Uh, using this want versus need dichotomy, sometimes we can write a very uh, compelling, a very satisfying story, one that leaves us happy in which the character does not at all get what they want. And I'll right. give you an example. The first Rocky movie, Rocky wants to be a heavyweight champion. He wants right. to win that big fight. If you watch the movie, what he needs, and uh, the great Burgess Meredith points it out 
very early in the movie. In it's a- to catch the chicken. Yes, exactly. Good point, Brad. All right, moving on. So. Catch the chicken, no, no, rock, no, no. rock, catch the chicken. chicken. That, that's one of one of America's cinema's <laughs> finest scenes. Catch the chicken, rock. What he needs, uh, along with that chicken, is <laughs> self-respect. He yes. needs he needs to find out who he is. He needs self-respect. And of course, you know, the love of a good woman is thrown in there uh, uh, for spice. Purely for Hollywood magic, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But at the end, and this is fascinating because again, this was this was a huge risk on the on the on the behalf of doing this first Rocky movie to do a movie in which he loses the fight. He doesn't get what he wants, but he gets what he needs. Right. And let's flip it around. Sometimes, uh, in fact, a lot of times, get a character that gets what they want but doesn't get what they need ends up being it can be a very satisfying story but it's usually a pyrrhic victory yeah Uh, meaning like it they go out and ball like so for example Thelma and Louise sort of get what they want, but they don't get what they need at the end of that movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. They flying off in a in a, a fit of independence <sighs> off that cliff gets them what they want to be free, right? Yeah. But it doesn't get them what they need, which is a society that treats them equally and fairly and gives <laughs> them a path where they can live a happy life, you know? Right. Not living in some patriarchal wasteland. So uh, what I'm saying is getting what you want can make for a satisfying story, absolutely, but sometimes it's a Pyrrhic victory of like- yeah. Uh, somebody blowing up a whole town, you know, uh, um, maybe Fight Club might even be up in, in that uh, with somebody getting what they want, but not what they need. Right. And that's where that's where you can really find not only in drama, but in comedy, uh, some really great storytelling. Uh, and once you for yourself kind of separate what want versus need is. That's why I was so happy, Dave, to see this question come in, because we did talk about that. Uh, and it's and it's worth uh, taking a little bit of time right at the top of the show to discuss the difference between want and need. And if I can make it personal for a second, yeah. I what I wanted was that restaurant <laughs> owner to just have one goddamn <laughs> moment of humanity and say how lovely that you and your wife fell in love in my restaurant. But what I needed, frankly, was that rice. It was delightful. They make amazing rice there. It was so you good. You needed to hand him that cash. Yeah, I needed, to, I needed to hand him that cash so that he would hand me the food so that I could leave. But I, what I wanted was one sparking moment of humanity oh, where he oh would look God. me in the eyes and say, I am happy that I brought you joy in some small part by my life's work. I actually, I had something very similar to that happen to me. Very similar. As a matter of fact, I took my kids back to Pizza Sam in Alma, Michigan, where I went to college. And I still say is among the best pizza in the country. And uh, I wanted a clean pizza box to take home with me to hang up in my studio just because. Oh, oh, oh I see. Clean pizza box. <laughs> Just I was like, what, what's, are there normally offensive jokes on this box? I didn't know what it was for a second. <laughs> no, just one that didn't have pizza grease in it. Cause I wanted to hang it up in my right. studio. Right. And I asked for a clean box and the guy's like, no, you can't have a box. I'm like, it's a lousy piece of cardboard. I, I, I brought my family back. I did the same thing. You know, we brought the kids back after I went to college. And finally, the waitress looked at the owner and said, why are you being a dick? Give the guy a box. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you needed as a waitress standing next to, uh, I, to I needed someone to be able to guilt that guy into having a shred of humanity. Yeah, All right, just well, Brad- a shred. Uh, just a shred. Let's move into our next question for this week. Uh, this is a good one. It uh, comes in uh, over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And it says, dear Brad and Bra- dear dad and brave. Uh, <laughs> you say, listen to your readers, not your reader. Yeah. But what do you do, Brad, when one reader is so loud mm-hmm. and all they do is complain that they aren't seeing the comics or art that they want to see? Every month, my patrons do a poll of character settings and themes for a special comic. And all they do is complain, why should I bother doing it? Nothing I pick ends up winning. Brad, this is an interesting question because it has a lot to do, there's a lot of intertwining things about fan service, about what an artist wants to do versus what their audience wants to do. It has a lot to do about how to handle Patreon. What are your answers for this person in terms of listening to your readers, not your reader? So Dave, there was this guy that wanted to become a monk. And he went and he joined the monastery and the friar tells him, listen, this monastery has a vow of silence. You may not speak, but every year on the anniversary of your signing up, you can come into my office and say two words. 
Guy says, that sounds great. Signs up and becomes a silent monk. A year later, walks into the friar's office. The friar says, congratulations, you made it a year. You can say two words. And the man says, food stinks. Walks out, does his monk stuff for the rest of the year. Another year goes by and he comes in on his second anniversary. And the friar says, congratulations, you've made it to a second year. You get to say two more words. And the man says, rooms? Cold. He leaves the office. Of course, comes back a third time after the third year. The friar comes, brings him in, says, Congratulations, you've been here for three years. You get to say two more words. And the man says, I quit. And the friar says, I'm not surprised. All you've done since you've gotten here is complain. <laughs> God damn it, I saw that joke coming in and it still made me laugh. <laughs> and that's exactly what's happening here, okay? Is 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 he's is, so read that uh, listen to that question. What do you do when one reader is so loud all they do is complain that they don't see what they want? They're not loud. You're focusing on them. And that makes them loud. They're the only ones you've got. I, I guarantee you, you've got 10 people saying, oh, this is great. You're the best. You're wonderful. One person says, why should I bother? The things I pick never get picked. Uh, and you're so focused on this person that that's thundering in your head. It's the only one you can hear. By the way, uh, you're totally normal <laughs> in this yeah, regard. There's absolutely. not an artist out there who doesn't know exactly what we're talking about yep. here. Yep. Uh, and what this person is trying to do is guilt tripping you into doing what they want because they know that what they want. By the way, notice the poll, the, the, the poll option that this person is choosing is not winning. That's not your fault. That's a, you put it up to a poll, a whole bunch of other people. The majority of the people that you are working with for your Patreon, they're choosing this other thing. It's not your fault. And this person is in the minority and they know that the only way that they can get your attention is by laying this guilt trip on you that they think is going to work and don't right. let it work. Do not bow to this. <laughs> it's not a good thing. Uh, don't, don't let them guilt trip you uh, because clearly they're in the minority. And if you start, if, if you start uh, trying to focus on keeping minority voices in your community assuaged, what's going to inevitably happen? You're going to take your eye off the ball and that's the majority that's actually there making it possible for you to uh, earn a significant income for this. So uh, don't let this person get into your head. Uh, yes. it, it's one voice. It's just one voice. Uh, it, it, the only way, reason it's loud is because you're making it loud. Exactly, exactly. And I, I like Brad, I will say that uh, it is a sh very human emotion that yeah. uh, every week you can get thousands of words of praise. Brad Geiger, you're the best. Brad yeah. Geiger, I love everything you do. Brad Geiger, ah. Uh, but you get one email that says, you know what, Brad Geiger is a hack or Brad Geiger, his line work is no good or Brad Geiger's yep. writing is, you know, whatever, whatever you could. We don't listen. Insult. Two examples were enough. <laughs> two examples were enough. No, no, no. I've got more. Hold on. Hold on. Let me just get out. Let me get out this list that I've prepared. Hold on. Uh, all right. Brad Geiger smells. Brad Geiger's choice of socks is choice. Uh, Brad Geiger makes dubious uh, food uh, selections at a subway when he orders from them. Uh, Brad Geiger's car uh, looks like it was driven by a librarian that doesn't have a will to live. Uh, Brad Geiger, if Brad Geiger had a pet, it would be a moose because it would just charge through the house and break everything. Uh, Brad, I don't know. Anyway. Um, okay. So and the only one that I remember from that series is where you said my line work sucked. How <laughs> dare you? <laughs> the, one that, the one that hit close to home. Yeah. Anyway, no. Um, I'll say it about me. Like any yeah. I can get 10,000 words of praise. Yeah. One insulting email, a boy it sticks in my craw. And I'm like, sure. Yeah. About right, how right, you draw there. eyes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. You had to get it in. You had to get it in. Jeez Louise. I was making jokes about your choice, your food selection at Subway, and you had to go right for how I draw eyes. All right. Fine. Uh, but, oh. but, but I mean, we're, we're goofing around, but listen, this, what, what Dave is saying is absolutely right. You hyper-focus on that. And, and I'll tell you what I mean. I said, I wasn't going to share this, but 
since I'm, I'm kind of laughing it up now, I, I, I'll just tell you. The, here's what happened. Ronaldo. I'm so happy you wrote this question because when you wrote this question, when you wrote this question, I had been having the exact same problem and it had been vexing me. I've got one person in my Patreon and I swear to God, he's it, 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 nitpicks, super little itty bitty details. He'll like call me out on. To be fair, though, everything that I'm sending you is true. Those are all good critiques. <laughs> yes. And uh, yes, I know. Very, very, <laughs> good, very good critiques. And I appreciate them. <laughs> Just make sure your pledge process is at the end of the month. <laughs> <laughs> that, and, and I swear to God, that's the only thing that keeps me going is because he's a $10 backer. And it's and although I've I'm telling you, Dave, here, I'm telling you the truth. My hand has hovered over the block button because the voice in my head says, it would be worth $20 to never hear from this guy again. Well, that's okay. So that's what I was going to get at before I, yeah. I went on my diatribe about yeah. insults to Brad um, was that the older I get and the more secure I get in my career, the less I suffer fools. Yeah. And because let's be honest on the great spectrum of human relationships. When someone is passively aggressively giving you like, no, I never get listened to around here. Uh, no one likes my ideas. Yeah. Oh boy, I, I feel like I would run this strip better is basically what they're saying. Yeah. Uh, that's a gentle, light form of abuse, but it's still abuse <laughs> yeah. and it has an impact. Like it doesn't matter if they're supporting you with money in the same way that you can have a, a, a relationship in life where someone is ostensibly kind to you, but in the meantime, they're abusive to you, right? Right, right. So I, I, over the course of my last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, I've been cutting frankly, passive aggressiveness, slightly abusive uh, relationships out of my life. And so when it comes to readers that are that, that are that kind of way, I both don't respond to them on Twitter, which I think is a, a key thing. Mm -hmm. You go you go silent. That's yes. option one. Yes. Option two uh, is uh, you start to find ways to filter so that their voice doesn't get out to anyone else in terms of uh, uh, shared boards and stuff. And then option three is like Brad said, just blocking because yeah. it's not it's not worth the the anguish that you're clearly going through enough to write a question to two podcast hosts yeah. to take that five dollars, ten dollars, whatever right. it is. That is not worth the joy that your art is giving you. It's not worth letting that person steal that from you. Yeah. And I'm telling you, it got to the point where it was affecting my writing because yeah, I'm I like, tell. oh, I've got I've got to be careful because if I write this certain thing, this person's going to call yeah. me out. And then and, you second and, guess. Exactly, Brad. And, yes. And second guessing is no good for comedy. Second, no, nobody's ever written a good joke. Second guessing themselves. I'm right. telling you. And it would get into my head. And, and I literally my hand is hovered over the button uh, three different times because I'm like, this ten dollars is not worth it. I can do without this particular person's ten dollars. And uh, it's really been. Uh, it, it, I'm telling you, it got into my head and it, I've been dealing with this for a few months now. Ronaldo question come in and I look at it and I'm like, Ronaldo, Ronaldo for crying out loud. It's just one person. You cannot let one person get into your head. You just put that person over there in the, and all of a sudden I get done answering his question in my head yeah. and I'm like, Oh I just answered my own question. <laughs> I just answered my own question. I can't let this guy get into my head. I do. Yeah. I, and, and I've kind of, I'm, I'm, I've, I've given myself the same advice that I'm giving to you. And that right. is don't let him get into your head. Uh, take that. I say, uh, you know, take the money and run unless it, unless it happens more often. And uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, use that behavioral modification that I've talked about in the past, where if, if there's a, if, the, if this person says something friendly and happy and polite, I immediately write back, right? I'll, I'll respond to that comment. Mm -hmm. Nitpicky stuff. I do not respond. And right. it's, I'm, I'm hoping over time they will uh, get the picture. Get the hint. Get yeah, the hint. Yeah. Take the hint. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but at the same time, I know that if I get pushed much further, I'm going to go right over to what Dave's saying. And it's like, it, that's it. I got to cut this person out because if I have one more writing session where I sit there and bite my fingernails because of being scared of being nitpicked by this guy uh, or or any other part of the process, drawing, uh, let, uh, inking, lettering, what have you, uh, I, I cannot let that bring me down. This person is not helping me. And uh, foregoing that $10 a month by that one patron might be the best money I ever spent. 
Yeah. And it's uh, as Brad said, it is hard. It is hard. Yeah. We have to admit that it is hard to cut out the one negative Nancy voice. Yeah. But I will say this, and this is very pop psychology. I am not trained in any way in psychology, but I have noticed as I've gotten older, for whatever reason, we want to psychologically ascribe it to some people. Some readers just like to go through life unhappy, oh. even when they are ostensibly pleased by what you are producing. Oh, yeah. It's like they're choosing to 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 sit in in bile for whatever reason, uh, or they're choosing to just uh, vent for whatever reason, even though they are clearly enjoying your comic enough to read it. That's one thing yeah. enough to read it on the regular. That's a second step. And then to read it on the regular and give you money. And yet they're going to complain about what they're given. Like yeah. That's someone who is choosing to be unhappy on some level. Yeah. I'm not a psychologist. I don't know why they would do that. There's a thousand reasons why they could do that. But at some level, you as a human have to go, you know what? Shine them. I can't. All I can do is create the art that uh, that's making yeah. me happy. And then if they're choosing to like it, that's up to them. I can't I can't make them enjoy the, the delightful sandwich I've made them over here at Subway. <laughs> I, there's another I mean, as long as you're going to get into the psychology of it, uh, there's another thing that has crossed my mind time and time again. And that is this. To a certain extent, I think what they're actually trying to say is, I like you so much, I'm paying attention to every detail. Look, look right. how closely I regard your work to the extent that I saw that one character was taller than the other character on page three. And then in another scene, the camera angle shifted and one of them looked like they were taller than the other. Right. Uh, there's a. Uh, there's only one person. Uh, well, no, not only one person. There's two types of people uh, who are going to point that out. One of them is just the jerk who who cannot miss an opportunity to be, you know, I told you so. Or mm -hmm. uh, did you, you know, uh, did you know that I know something, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and the other person I really do believe is the person that says, I like you so much that I'm hyper fixated that I don't, I even notice these granular details and they want to share that with you, it's a bizarre kind of compliment. What they don't understand is that we take it as an abject insult. <laughs> right, we don't right. want to be nitpicked. <laughs> we well, don't listen, want it. I'm going to steal a little something that every HR department will always tell managers, right? Yeah. Which is you praise in public and you critique in <laughs> private, right? Yeah. And so when a reader is critiquing you in public, even though they could send you an email or a yeah. DM saying, oh, hey, God, Brad, yes. there, you have a, a typo right here. Yeah. What they're really wanting is whatever egotistical uh, elevation they get where because some readers, Brad, I, I know they exist because I've dealt with them. They're like, Dave is so close to doing drive well, but if he just had yes. my ability to do X, Y, Z, he, this would be so much more elevated. Like there's a part of them that thinks they could do it better. And right. so they're like, Dave, you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to stop doing this. And it's like, I, I, I love you. Go with God. I don't need your opinion on, on how to do drive. I know how yeah. to do it. I know what I'm doing. You know, that kind of thing. So on some level, it's, it's a, the confidence to know what you're doing is what you want to be doing and that you're happy with it. And also to know that uh, it is not worth letting even passively aggressive, abusive people ruin your process because it's making Brad hesitate in his writing, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and to be able to trust yourself is one of the most fundamental things you need as a writer and an editor for yourself. And so if Brad's yeah. losing that, it's not worth that five, 10, $20 from that guy every month, right? right. Or for you in this case, Ronaldo. Yeah. Um, and even separate from the confidence that you felt, Brad, it's also, if it's starting to impact your joy of creating, Remember, we got into art making not necessarily for the money or the fancy lifestyle. It's for the joy of the creation of this process, you know, yeah. like uh, that, that, that is. And so if someone's robbing you of that, that is a problem. And that's yeah. a problem that you need to address by either finding a way to mentally block them out or maybe even blocking them. So that's that's my suggestion. Absolutely. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. 
Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. So, Dave, uh, as we're coming back from the break, I wanted to mention that uh, we talked about social media an awful lot on this show, especially in the past several episodes. We've been talking about late stage social media and the effect that social media has had on us as creators. I just want to recommend if you haven't seen it yet uh, to definitely give this a watch. It was really, really fascinating for me. It's a documentary called 15 Minutes of Shame. Have you heard about this? Uh, yes. Uh, is that the story about me in the locker room in high school? Of the first time <laughs> yeah. I had to get undressed? Is that what yes, that was? As a matter of, and they had photos. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, yeah. They, that were, sounds like- they were artists' uh, renderings of, uh, of, of like, you know, they had those police sketch artists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they had yeah, those guys right. in there. That's right. Uh, no, this is actually uh, produced by Monica Lewinsky. And who okay. comes out in, in the first, she does, she's, uh, she's kind of the narrator as well. She's not a, a main player in this, but she comes on in the beginning and says, listen, I was the first person whose reputation was destroyed by the internet. Certainly True. was not the last. Uh, and it, it, it's time to talk about the effect that social media has had on us as a society. And this mm-hmm. whole idea of, if social media is engineered to uh, uh, promote outrage and deliver outrage because that's what drives clicks. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's uh, it's on HBO max. If you get a chance, absolutely watch it. It's, I I don't know that it's, it's necessarily uh, actionable, but it is, it has really been on my mind as I'm parsing uh, in this late stage social media phase that we're in how I want to address social media moving forward. Uh, it, it's given me a lot to think about. And they take uh, the cases of several people who became uh, uh, the center of attention on social media uh, and gives you an awful lot to think about. I, I just want to recommend it. I, I think it's food for thought. Yeah, that's great. That's a great recommendation. I have not watched that yet, so I'm excited about that. And yeah. I will say um, one of the reasons why those of us that use social media really before recommendation algorithms kicked in or, mm-hmm. you know, if, if someone liked this, they're as likely to like this. Uh, before all that kicked in, social media was more pleasant in the sense that the system itself was not directing you towards conflict so much. Yeah. It was not trying to polarize as a way of generating clicks. And I liked it better. I don't know that we'll ever get back to that, that early first three or four years of Twitter, but it was delightful because it was more based on, there was genuine community building for a brief second yes. and, and, and a joy among cartoonists sharing with one another. Anyway, all that to be said, great recommendation, Brad. And I'm going to jump into a topic that I wanted to ask you, Brad, for this week, as we come back from the break. Um, I want to specifically ask you about your book creating process. Um, mm. Because now I've I've finished my most recent drive book. I've kickstarted it. I've gone through the post production. I've gone through the pre press. And as of right now, I believe they are boxing to ship, or at least prepping to box to ship. And given current transportation around the world, I will get those sometime in 2024. But anyway, <laughs> all that being said, <laughs> we're still we're still white knuckling that process, right? Yeah. All I need is a truck to get from one side of LA to the other, but that's going to oh, take six years. So yeah. uh, anyway, um, uh, so here's my question for you, because I've been examining my, my own emotional state through this process. And I wanted to ask you, yeah. at what point do you, Brad Geiger, enjoy having made a book is it when your drawing is done is it when your indesign layout is done is it when your proofs are received from the printer or is it when the book palette arrives or is it when your shipping is fulfilled or as it might be the case is it ever are you ever (laughs) really happy that a book that you've enjoyed having made a book what's the point where you are like the high point ah this is great that's a great question. It reminds me of that Dorothy Parker quote. I hate writing, but I love having written. Yes. Right? Yes. That's my uh, wife's favorite quote. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it's very true. I loathe sitting down to write. I love when I've gotten done uh, with that process and, and get to show it to people. Yeah. And, I, and, and so the, the answer is, uh, is, is that there is no answer. The answer is I love my comic. Uh, I, I, I get the best sense of satisfaction when Alex Heberling sends it back to me fully colored. 
And I love yeah. that comic. And I see yeah. it's like I tell Alex, uh, I've told her in the past, uh, it's it's like Christmas every time because Alex is the kind of colorist that always puts a little something extra in. If I've like just the other just today, I had a character with three stripes on his shirt. Uh, he's appeared uh, in four pages, right? Okay. Uh, by the fourth page, I started forgetting to draw the stripes because yes. I am not detail focused as my reader will tell you who likes to nitpick me. I'm not detail focused. Not no problem. She's got, she's got it covered, you know, boom, boom, boom. She, she just, you know, m- you know, massage those stripes in. Uh, every time I see what Alex has done with my comic, it's like Christmas. And I love having done a comic. Uh, but then there's the book and then you got to get the book done. And so yeah. then you go through the InDesign process and you go through the Kickstarter process. And it isn't until I've opened up and with trembling fingers, when you get that shipment and then you tip the driver and you open up. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. Not if you're Brad Geiger, you don't. You give him do a now. swift kick out the I, door. I do now. Now that I realize it was something you got to do. But I, with shaking hands, I open up that first box and reach into one book at random, pull it out and, and, and flip through. And I see all the pages are there. Nothing got printed sideways, you know, not, there's no pages missing. And once I've done that two or three times, you know, the same way that you used to hear, you know, my grandmother say, when somebody had a baby, did you count all the fingers and count all the toes, which was a a morbid thing to say (laughs) on the birth of a baby. But it was the first thing she always said. Uh, Once I've counted all the fingers and counted all the toes, and I look at that book uh, with its glossy cover and its dust jacket in my hand, Ah, uh, I love having made a book. Ah, uh, and, but then I, I still got to ship all those things out. Yeah. <laughs> I got to still put yeah. them in the box. So it, 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 I guess, and, and, and by the time I've packaged up the last box or at least the last major box, you know, from the shipment, and there's just a few that's got to get uh, an artist edition put in them and all that kind of stuff. Once I've done the last of the shipment, then I'm really, really satisfied with the publishing process. Uh, that lasts for about a day, and then it's time <laughs> to do it all over again. <laughs> so I get, I, I get, I guess my answer is I'm satisfied three times. It lasts very shortly, and the cycle renews almost immediately. What what has your experience been? I actually think I was kind of curious to see what your response is going to be, but I'm uh, kind of pleasantly surprised that you so perfectly and succinctly put it i think i'm the same way that i always think whatever the next stage in the bookmaking process when that's done then i will be happy and it's it's kind of a version brad we've talked about this on the show of the false joy and the false um there's a psychological term for it i don't remember what it is but that that anticipatory sense that when i win this award then i will be forever happy well you win the award and you're happy for a day or two maybe a week and then it's back to it's back to resetting to your normal baseline psychology of how you feel about your art. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's a little bit about how I feel about the bookmaking process. I'm so like you, first of mm-hmm. all, I should say, whenever I give Beth a page and I I'm very aware of what I am capable of drawing with my line art. I get it to the best place I can where I'm satisfied with it. Right. But I know what I'm capable of. And so I, I always kind of know what to expect when it's done. Yeah. I never know what magic I'm going to get back from Beth because I'm I'm mostly aware, but not fully aware of what she's capable of. And I love the surprises, you know, yeah. and it always elevates it and it's always better. So, yes, I just want to I want to acknowledge you on that point that that's true. But when we go to lay out the book, there's a joy in seeing it all laid out in sort of a pre PDF. If you have, you know, yeah, if you if you get yeah. my drift, right? That's sort of fun. There's there's real real fun in seeing it at the proof stage. And yet, when you get the physical proofs, you're always catching like ten mistakes, and they're eating at your soul because you're like, what yes! else am I missing? I yes! caught these ten, but what other four will I not catch? So I kind of hate that stage, even though I enjoy that stage, right? <laughs> 
And like you, my my printer sends me two or three advanced copies when the book is done printing. Yes. And when I open that package, Brad, this is this is exactly what I feel like. Yeah. I feel like I'm about to go on stage in high school to give my public speech about why I'm running for student council. And yeah. is my zipper down? Did I just wet my pants? Like all those fears that you have, you know what I mean? About public failure. That's what it that's a version of what I feel like when I unwrap the book. Because at that point, I can't take it back. Whatever mistakes are in that book, I'm going to kind of have to ship out. And so that's going to feel like public embarrassment. So even though I should enjoy that moment to the 10th degree, like Brad said, even until I flip like through the whole book three times, I'm like, oh, I'm going to find a mistake. I'm going to find a mistake. I'm going to find a mistake. Yeah. And then I will say one of my happiest joys is a day after flipping through the book three times. I will leave the book out in my studio and I'll walk by it like the next oh! day or two days later. And I'll be like, oh, the book, look the book that. is, oh, look at that. I made a, oh, oh, aren't I a, aren't I a special little sunshine? Uh, that, <laughs> do, you leave, days, do you leave it by the window? So maybe like somebody walking by might see it like the postman that happens to just glance over. Oh, I, I see I'm delivering mail to someone who's done a book. UPS. Oh, hello. What is this in the window? What is this beautiful piece of work? Is this your book? Did you create this? Oh my goodness. You should be feeling great about yourself. Uh, no, yeah. So I feel great about that. I also feel there's a huge satisfaction when I get all the books put away, if that makes yeah. sense. The yeah. palette has arrived, but now I've got to transfer to my warehouse shelving. And that's always a pit that it's, it's easy. It, it was easier in my late twenties than it is now. That's always a process, yeah. but I got to say, okay, so now to, to get to the final point, though, I yeah. think my greatest point of satisfaction is I just a few months ago sold out of my anatomy of animals book, a anatomy oh, nice. of animals book. Yeah. So there's only I only have like five left in the world and I'm keeping mm -hmm. them just for me, the five yeah. that I have in case I want to give them to kids or something. And uh, that is an oddly satisfying feeling of like, I liked the book. I like what it did for me. Uh, I, I was really proud of the final result and it's sold out. And now yeah. it's the sense of like kids off to college kind of a feeling, you know, it's done. Yeah. I've done my work. Uh, so that might be the only brief glimpse of true joy. What I'm having made a book <laughs> is when it's sold out and everything is done. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think you're probably right. What you, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a never ending series of being happy very briefly and then going on to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's I mean, maybe that's a description of life. Brief moments of happiness followed by, <laughs> oh, God, what's next? Oh, God, what do I got to do next? Well, I tell you what is next is another question coming in from one of our five dollar Patreon backers. And it goes like this coming in from Adam, who says, hello, Brad and Dave. My wife is on the faculty of a local liberal arts college. And as her spouse, I have free access to the courses there. What courses or lines of study would you recommend to pursue outside of the visual arts, which sadly is unavailable at this particular institution? To broaden the question for fellow listeners, what one or two courses out of a local community college uh, might you recommend to cartoonists to assist in their comics creation or business pursuits. Thanks for the excellent podcast and resources. P.S. My wife is extremely disappointed that neither of our comics uncles chose to summer vacation here on the bustling metropolis of Dubuque, Iowa. <laughs> Dave, let's Adam. handle that last one first. How come no Dubuque uh, uh, signing trips, uh, David? It's so, Adam, I got to tell you something that might surprise you. Dave Kellett has actually been to Dubuque, Iowa. Brad, have you been to Dubuque? No, no. I, the only thing I know about Dubuque is that it, it's such a funny sounding word that it always gets used in punchlines. But I've not, never actually been to Dubuque. It, Dubuque is kind of like Susquehanna. It just is one of those words that comedy writers from the 30s used all the time. You know, yep. it, was, it was just far enough from New York, which at the time was the king of comedy that that anyway, uh, I like Iowa a lot. Um, and uh, <laughs> I got there a few times Iowa? when I what's that? What took you to Iowa? What, what, what so reason did you have? One of my roommates at uh, Notre Dame when I went to school in Indiana, he was from Iowa. And mm. I, as a California boy, for whatever reason, Iowa sounded very exotic to me. That's a weird way to say it, but it did sound exotic. <laughs> it sounded to exotic me like, Iowa. Yeah, come see exotic Iowa. Doo -doo -doo! Um, 
for me, growing up in California, Iowa just seemed like the polar opposite of what California was. So I just wanted to see it. <laughs> so I ended up going to like Thanksgiving at his house one year and, and uh, you know, just kind of seeing what Iowa was. Yeah. And uh, anyway, Adam, I don't know that anything will will bring me back because comics wise, I don't know that there's a lot going on in Dubuque or Des Moines or anything. Is there a Des Moines Comic Con? Maybe there is. There, I, I probably a small one. Like, and and uh, you know, maybe maybe you know, it, it, it's time for you to consider that uh, Des Moines Comic Con. Yeah, they need an ad campaign. Dave Kellett, come back to Iowa. It's time. <laughs> come back to where we, your roots it's, are. It's been enough years. Come back to Iowa. Anyway, so Adam, first of all, let's talk about this awesome uh, perk of your wife working at a local liberal arts college yeah. where the spouse uh, or partner gets to take classes. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That is legit awesome. But that is a cool perk. And I wish uh, more places offered that. Maybe they do. And I just didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. But as far as the line of study um, to recommend uh, so they don't have any visual arts. Okay, that's a granted. I would honestly uh, suggest if someone is in a similar situation where they have access or somewhat access to free uh, courses and they are in an art making vein, if a college does not offer any art or visual arts as classwork, I would suggest maybe classes in entrepreneurship or small business or basic accounting. I think yes. those will there's there's very few lines of, of work in cartooning where those three wouldn't come in handy. Brad, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you're 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 uh, preaching to the choir here. I was going to go along the very same lines in that. I think to a certain degree, uh, the last thing I would suggest is an art class because your art is something that you will develop and improve at the more you you do it. Right. Uh, uh, I admit it like if you had an opportunity at a sequential art class, uh, that would be great, but it is not near the top of my list. Uh, I, I co-sign everything Dave said. And I also would say, uh, because you've heard me say it before on the show, the writing is way more important than the art nine chances out of 10. There's a couple of, uh, I'd say outliers to that argument, but uh, if you're doing humor, Absolutely. The writing is more important. And in a lot of other comics, the writing is key. So I would suggest a writing class, a creative writing class. If you had it, uh, you know, uh, one that uh, zeroed in on the kind of writing you're interested in better still. Uh, I would also say marketing. I yes. would take a yes, marketing that's a, that's class. That's a great one, a marketing class. Uh, yeah. Because so much of what we do as independent artists really come down to understanding marketing. So I would I would include entrepreneurship in that, accounting, yes, running a small business, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I would I would take a hundred classes, none of which have anything to do with art. I it occurred to me that wouldn't it be funny if our answer was like a completely out of left field. Like the, the here's the course you want to take, Adam. You really want to focus in on a course that looks deeply at the structure, the logistics and the communications of Genghis Khan's empire. Now, the reason <laughs> I'm going to suggest that is because imagine running an empire that ran from the edge of Europe all the way to China. How do you handle the logistics? How do you handle the communications? And Adam's at the other end of this podcast like, wait, what? Why do I want to study Genghis Khan? I don't know why. No, I don't want to do this. So here's the deal. When you're sacking a city, <laughs> what you want to do is you want to make sure to surround the city and then launch the diseased animal corpses into the city. That's what you want to do. Uh, 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 right. Uh, so let's take a page out of Genghis Khan's book. All right. Uh, no. So, yeah, I think business marketing, uh, writing, if there's a writing class um, and frankly, something that uh, that uh, that sparks your interest, because uh, I don't know, Brad, would you go back? Let me ask you this, Brad. Would you go back and do college again if you could? Oh. College, I would go back and do in a heartbeat. I would high school. You, 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 you couldn't drag me back. College, I would go back because I was so slow to warm up, but because right. I was so slow to come out of my shell, I didn't really start doing college until my senior year, and then, oh man, was I doing college? <laughs> uh, and then it was over. So I would go back and do knowing, especially knowing now, you know, what I know, I would go back and do college in an instant. Would you? I would go. I would go back to college. I mean, listen, I, only if if life really w threw me f asunder and I kind of had to start over, would I ever go back? But yeah. I would love to do it. Yeah, I think yeah. I think college now I know how, how I would do college, how I would tackle college so differently than how I did it. <sighs> as a 20 or 21 year old, whatever it was, 
Yeah. Um, I would love to go back to do college again. Yes, absolutely. I, I would love it. I, I would take like a, infinitely more classes. As as somebody that teaches college, it's something that I've grappled with for a long time. And that is a college is absolutely wasted on people in their 20s. And I mean that seriously. They are not yeah. in a place. They're not mentally <laughs> in a place. I, it, they're, they're, they're not they're They don't have an appreciation for it. Uh, for what you're being I, offered. Yeah. And I was the same way. I said, I've, I've used this example a lot of times. Art history, you could not get me to pay attention to art history. If I took an art history class today, yeah. oh my God, I would eat that right up. It's so interesting. It's so fascinating. I would also be asking a thousand questions. The professor would be like, yes, from the from the 65-year-old man in the back, David <laughs> yeah. Kellett, sit in down, the please. Back, you'd be right <laughs> up in the front. I know you yeah, better I, than that. You just <laughs> And you'd be sitting right next to me. Uh, it, it, it really seems like I, I, it's too bad we can't figure out a way <laughs> to give people in their 20s an opportunity. And by the way, that's not a put down to you if you're in your 20s. I think that you should be out doing all those things that you want to do in your 20s. 20s. I sure. think you should have, I think we should have, I'd love to have figure out some way we could give people in their twenties an opportunity to be the most 20 something that they could possibly be. And then bring them back in their thirties and say, okay, now sit down and, <laughs> and learn something. There's the people in their twenties are the perfect example of want versus need. Oh, uh, 20 year olds oh, in that. college are the perfect example of want versus need. Yes. But I'll, I will say this though about going back to college is that like, can I ask you, is it, is there a world where someone whose kids have left the house, you're now an empty nester yeah. and you're, you're, you suddenly have X amount more hours in a week, even though I have a degree, could I enter college again? I'm not, I'm not, oh, I'm only I'm half bullshitting you. Like, no, would I'm they sure accept you, you could. I'm sure you could. In fact, we, I, 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 it was rare, but like we, at, at, at where I went to college every now and again, there'd be some gray hired old uh, lady in the back uh, and she'd be like, oh yeah, I'm just taking the class because I'm interested. You well, know, I know, it, I know you can audit a class. I know yeah. you like, cause I do that actually with the local university once in a while I audit a class, but like, I mean like legit you're 65, you have already have a BA or an MA or an MS or whatever it is. And yet you go back in as a freshman. Can you do, I mean, I guess they'll take the money. They're not I'm dummies. Sure I was going to say, if you're willing to pay those prices, they <laughs> yeah, would absolutely yeah. take it. They're, but that's, they're uh, like, but well, we would love that hundred thousand dollars from you. I'm yeah. telling you, I'm telling you, know, we, we kind of disparage community colleges, but that's where your community local community college has a super strength and that is it's a it's much more affordable and you can get uh, just like this person's talking about in their question you can get really really good training uh and good information at your local community college yeah uh, that's that would be the first place that i would go if i had that extra time and money i, I would go to my co community college and take a marketing class or or, or take a, an accounting class something like that absolutely what would just out of curiosity what would you major in now if you were going to go back to college if i were to make if i so if I were to major in something, I tell you what, I would challenge myself to be a marketing major. I would go, I would go, I would go outside of art and writing. Like, yeah. like it would be writing was the first one that came to mind, but let's face it. Let's face it. That's, that's in my wheelhouse, right? That's right. something that I, 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 I'm learning about writing every week as I'm writing marketing and also writing. Let's face it is a Again, one of those things that the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. If right, you're paying right. attention, if you're right. paying attention and being honest with yourself, the more you do it, the, the better you're going to get at it. That's not true for marketing. Marketing is something that someone's got to sit down and show you uh, and teach you certain things and show you how certain things work and give you an introduction to certain tools and certain processes. Marketing, somebody has to teach you. Writing, I could argue that you could learn on your own if you're paying right. attention right. and and just taking some opportunities for some uh, directed feedback, like to every now and again, sit down for a portfolio review or or sit down for a critique with somebody who knows what they're doing and then yeah, go yeah, back yeah. into the field. You can't do that with entrepreneurship. You can't do that with marketing. If I were to go back now, I would take something that I absolutely could not learn on my own and the first one that comes to mind is marketing. 
Yeah, for me, I would I would want to do something that was uniquely just about the love of it. Like I would love to go to Oxford and just study Tolkien. I think that would be so fun. Oh, really? I know that sounds so nerdy, but I I would love to do four years at I also to Oxford is lovely and it's a beautiful the little the little river going through is gorgeous and all that. But I think studying Tolkien for four years would be so fun. Uh, and I, I think that'd be, I, I don't know. I think that'd be awesome. But, uh, did I ever tell you this, Brad, when, when Savannah college of art and design asked me to come down to teach some classes uh, and I was thinking about it, mm -hmm. one of my thoughts was, would it be weird if I taught my classes, but then as a professor went and audited the other or a comics professor's oh. classes. I guess I don't, I kind of wouldn't care. I'd be like, no, I'm happy to learn. Consider me a naive, like, I just want to learn whatever you want to give me. I'll soak it up. Yeah. Uh, don't think of me as a peer. Think of me as a student kind of thing. You know, I, I would love to do that, but I don't know. Maybe that's just me being weird. It would be fun. It would be fun. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I, there are times, uh, because at university of the arts, they just, uh, put out, a, you know, they're, they're, they're saying, you know, we want to grow. We want to do this. And if you have any ideas, and I'm looking around and I'm like, oh, I could start. Uh, I would love to start like a comics uh, a major at a university like this. And I started thinking, what would it take? And <laughs> the art and the writing classes which is near the lower part of the list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it would be a lot of entrepreneurship classes, a lot of marketing classes, uh, some web design, uh, that kind of stuff. Coding. Uh, it would be it, the way I would structure a sequential arts degree is is would be very interesting. But Adam, honestly, I, I'm going to give you the advice that I give to Dave Kellett whenever he finds himself at a Sunday buffet, which is try everything. Also, <laughs> that's another possibility. <laughs> yeah. All the things that you're like, I don't know. Do I like pigs in a blanket? Try it. It's a buffet. It. Go for it. Just try it. <laughs> I don't yeah. I don't know if I like roast beef for breakfast. Try it. But who knows? Yeah. Maybe you like roast beef for breakfast. Everything you learn about is going to turn into creative fodder. It's going to yes. it's going to spur your creativity no matter what. You can, and, and that's where you could take one of those medieval classes. Uh, I guarantee you it would uh, uh, fire up your creativity. So yeah, don't, don't uh, hesitate at all to take any class that interests you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, so Dave, we have time for one last question. We can squeak this one in at the end of the show. Uh, this one comes in from Alan Gladfelter, who says, this question is a lead in to another question. Have you heard of cartoonist from the 1970s, 1980s named Ken Muse? Wait, so this question is a lead in to another question. Well, where's the other question? It's a lead in to another question. And, and the question he's asking is, have you heard of a cartoonist by the name of Ken Muse? I have not. Neither have I. All right. I guess we're going to have to wait for the follow up on that. <laughs> 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 this is this is going to be interesting now. Now we can wait and find out what the follow up now, is. Tune in two or three weeks from now, everyone, yeah. when we find out what the follow up to that email was. All right, here we go. I'm, I'm intrigued. Uh, and until <laughs> then, I got to tell you that you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. And just a reminder to people when they submit questions, if then statements do exist. So feel free to use an if then statement in your email. Your hosts have been my friend Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And my friend Dave Kellett, the co-director of the comics documentary Stripped and the cartoonist of Sheldon with very well-drawn eyes at sheldoncomics.com and drive at drivecomic.com. And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. And don't forget our sponsor for this week, the good folks at Wacom, the makers of the Wacom One over at wacom.com. If you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode like this one. This one came in from Xander, gave a five-star review, says, French Champagne, great show full of laughs and love, great part of my day, and will always be the best comics podcast. Ah, uh, that's fantastic. Thank you, yeah. Xander. That's great. That made my day. And Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that like Alan's follow-up question. <laughs> 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 oh my god oh that's too funny
Well, Brad, uh, it's funny you should mention the philosophical musings of Mick Jagger because I just wanted to read my favorite quote ever uh, from Keith Richards. It's right oh, here. Keith and Richards. Keith said, <laughs> I can't agree with him more. Amen, Keith. That's what I say to that. Amen. That's right.